Good evening. How is everybody? Pretty good? Happy Nuclear Science Week. Woo! <laughs> Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us on today's session, um, teaming with Canada for Australia's nuclear energy future. So, no further ado, um, our first speaker today is Dr. David Collins. David is the founder, director, and principal environmental engineer at Synergetics Consulting Engineers. He has 40 years international experience as an engineer, scientist, and environmental policy specialist. David has been involved in fundamental research and problem solving in the areas of emissions, air quality and energy across mining, manufacturing, power generation, buildings and infrastructure for international corporations and also governments. Today, David will outline some of the key conclusion of a recent nuclear energy conference held at MIT in Boston. Please welcome David to the stage. Thanks, Joe, and thank you all for coming here tonight. Guys, I'm going to start by taking my jacket off and rolling my sleeves up because that's what we all have to do because it's time to get to work. There's, there's a lot to be done. So let me start. Um, now, there's a, there's a laser pointer here. I understand that uh, this is very powerful, so I'll try not to point it in anyone's eyeballs. Um, I'm going to talk about not so much the Canadian part of this, but, but the MIT part of this. So we started off on our Kentucky tour. Uh, visiting Boston, where I was really as ill as I've ever been in my life. And uh, between the sort of blowing my nose and going off to find a doctor in the U.S., which is rather a challenge, I, I attended these courses. And uh, um, in fact, so I'll start going through some of the things we did. I've divided it up into seven parts, um, starting off in, with, I've, I've had to provide this at the start. It wasn't something we dealt with at MIT but an introduction to Australia's current net zero options because it's basically the sort of starting point for why we're here now, I think. And if I can provide that context, I think you'll appreciate the, the next slides. Uh, acknowledgements to all of these people who, uh, who taught us at MIT. Uh, as a preface, there's, look, there's a bunch of acronyms I'm gonna talk about today, uh, acronyms rather, and there's also uh, a, some, a bunch of uh, citations that I've included in this. Look, I haven't been able to get them all. They're just some of the information is, is, um, is based upon de uh, references. I can't, I can't find the original source. But please come and ask me anything afterwards. I've, got, I've left cards on the table there. Grab one, send me an email, call me up. First, introduction to Australia's current net zero options. I've got an image here, and this is from, by the way, I normally walk around, I'm more of like a Jeffrey Robinson kind of guy, so I feel a bit constrained here, and, uh, and the, and the uh, rostrum's too heavy to lift, so I'm going to stay put here, okay? But I would say this about this slide, that this is an appreciation, I hope, of the complexity of the renewable energy plans for Australia. And this is produced by an organization called AEMO. I'm not going to explain all these acronyms, it'll take too much time. And this is for one of their uh, main, if you like, let's call it scenarios. It's called a step change scenario. The detail doesn't matter, but this is, uh, my point is I've used the step change scenario when I've compared apples and apples, which you'll see. And I wanted to show you something very important. Just consider the complexity of this. This is the renewable energy system that they're planning to install. They retain thermal energy systems. They've got 10 gigawatts of fossil fuel that remains in AMO's plan. So this is not a zero carbon plan. This is a almost, this is a part zero carbon plan. Um, they still have uh, gas in here, natural gas. They've got hydro, they've got grid scale battery, they've got pumped hydro, they've got solar panels, and they've got wind. These have an explicit cost, which if you dig into the document, how many people here have read any of the AEMO documents, the ISP? You poor bastards. Isn't it? It's so difficult to navigate your way around that. And it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's been tough for me. Trying to find some of these numbers has been very difficult. What they don't talk about is, let's call it the implicit costs. So there's, there's all these costs here, and what are they? There's rooftop PV. There's people's batteries at home and in businesses. There's people's EV cars. And, and hydrogen we'll deal with later. But all of these are an essential part of AEMO's plan 
So if you have solar panels on your roof, they're going to be trying to control it. They're going to be including that in their allowance for powering stuff that you probably don't even care about. But they'll draw on your batteries and they'll use that uh, to service their interests as part of controlling the system. And they have to do that because otherwise they're just not going to have enough of this. Even so, the cost of this implicit, I call it the implicit capital costs, is almost as much as their explicit cost. When you add the two of these together, explicit and implicit, the total cost is $623 billion, okay? If you realize that because wind, solar, and batteries have to be replaced about every 20 years, that means in the course of a 60-year, say, nuclear plant, you've got to replace that not just once, but a total of three times, three times. And not all of it, I admit, because some of the transmission is still um, doesn't have to be replaced. But when you add up, say, say if you said 50% of this number had to be replaced at 20-year mark, and then another 50% at the 40-year uh, mark, your total cost ends up, and this is dollars, this isn't dollars of the day. I haven't tried to do any fancy MBA analysis because I just wanted to make it for this discussion simple. But I wanted to make the point that there's a very, very significant cost here that hasn't been considered. And when you account for the replacement of these components, your total cash cost is in the order of $1.2 trillion for the AEMOS <coughs> system. Let's have a look at what nuclear would be. This is nuclear. You've got two things. You've got your consumers and you've got nuclear power stations. That's it. A lot simpler, isn't it? A lot easier to control. A lot lower risk in so many ways. What's the cost? $471 billion, and I've based this on the UAE power stations, which is the recent. I've added on a margin to account for on some uncertainties here. And this is in Australian dollars. All of this is in Australian dollars. And so 471 versus 1.2 trillion. That's a number to put in your head. OK. I mentioned hydrogen before. I said I'd talk about that. Well, this is the a slide related to hydrogen. This comes from the MIT guys, one of the, one of the folks, one of the speakers there. Hydrogen is really important. And the reason why is it's the material that we can use to replace transportation liquids that we need in airplanes, that we need in trucks, mining, industrial liquids that we need to make new industrial products. Uh, gas, we can obviously, hydrogen is a gas, so we can use that to place, replace a lot of our, um, our gases for, for burning and so on. And so hydrogen has a huge role to play in flying our, allowing us to fly our planes and, at zero carbon. OK. Let's talk about the limits and risks of, of our uh, renewable systems. Um, so, so we've had renewables now for the last 50 years. We've been working on this, a lot of people, for a long time. And there's almost bugger out of show. This is the trend. This is the trend that was 50 years ago. And this is the same trend we have now. Guess what, fellas? What we're doing now is not working. We have to find a better way. The A, the uh, AEMO, as they, as, as they call it, AEMO, they, gee, they should have a better acronym. Um, they're basically going to be more of the same. Now, does that make sense? If this isn't working, why would you keep doing the same damn thing? Okay, some of the problems with, uh, with uh, renewables. So this is what happens at the start of any project. What you get is you get this problem where it takes a while to build up public support. And then you get the steeper curve where you get a lot of, let's call it, um, development. And, and a good example of this is Germany. So they've, they started off here and they had to convince, you know, uh, okay, we have to do, we've got nuclear now, but we're going to go to renewables. Uh, we're going to have a lot of, uh, of wind and solar systems around the landscape, but it'll be okay. Now, how many people have been to Germany and seen the solar panels and the wind stations across Germany. Put your hands up at that. It's just insane. You go around the countryside, and almost every corner you turn, you see, you know, wind and you see solar panel arrays covering over, covering great agricultural land. 
you know, not a smart idea, I wouldn't have thought. Anyway, they've, they've had this aggressive outlay, but then now what's happening is that land is becoming more scarce, the, you know, accessible land. They're having trouble getting approval. The Bavarians are pushing back, not to your, you know. And so as a, as a consequence, there is a huge risk that even here in Australia, the deployment of renewables, which frankly takes otherwise useful land and covers it over, forget about the ecology. Okay, maybe we don't care about that. But gee, I mean, just agriculturally, that we do care about that. And to be honest, a lot of us do care about the ecology. I care about it. And that's what we're being asked to do. How much land are we going to cover? The answer is that some of the proposals have an area bigger than Tasmania covered with solar cells in Australia to meet our 2050 needs. So let me repeat that. An area larger than the size of Canada, sorry, uh, Tasmania, not Canada. Canada that's too big. <laughs> so, larger than Tasmania will be covered by solar cells. Imagine getting the approvals process up for that. That's, that's going to be a very difficult thing. So if you add up all these risks, let's go through them. This is the risks associated with renewables. Are renewables actually scalable? The answer is we don't know yet because we haven't done it before on this scale. Can we get the transmission lines out to these places at a reasonable price? And can we do them so that they're, they're frankly reliable and they don't get blown over in the wind or get damaged by other, uh, other activities? We don't know yet. We haven't done this before at this scale. Long-term storage. We have to have... So what happens here in Australia, as you all know, is that sometimes you have weeks of cold, dark weather, maybe sometimes without much wind. So you haven't got wind, and you haven't got sun. So how are we going to get renewables? The answer is we have to have some backup. And that backup that's being planned is two types. One is it's hydro, massive big hydro dams. Those of you who are familiar with it, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there's a thing called Snowy 2.0. And that was first started by, um, you know, several years ago, I think 19, uh, sorry, 2017, uh, by Malcolm Turnbull, and it was going to be $2 billion. The price now is $10 billion and going up. So this is the challenge we face. We're dealing not just with unknowns, we're dealing with first of a kind, because we haven't done this sort of thing before in Australia on this scale. And can you imagine if, if everyone costs us in, if we think it's going to cost us $2 billion. Like that number I had before up, that $383 million, that a billion that they've allowed for, what if that was double that? Okay, widespread demand response achievable. For those of you who aren't aware of this, in order to run a renewable system, you have to be able at times to control the demand. That means like calling you up and saying, hey, mate, you, know, you need to turn off your refrigerator, that sort of thing. Or, of course, it'll be done online. It'll be done automatically. You'll, have, you'll get your air conditioning turned off, et cetera. Now, at the moment, they're sort of making that voluntary, but who knows in the future what that will be if they really get stuck. You know, then we might have to turn off things that we wouldn't otherwise do it. It's tough. You know, it's, it's not just hospitals. It's, it's homes. We have elderly people who maybe rely on kidney machines or maybe they, you know, they just need the light to get around. You know, that's a big problem. Um, System costs acceptable. So at the end of the day, there's going to be a, a, a bill that has to be paid by someone. The people who are going to pay it are the, are the taxpayers of Australia. Do we want to pay $1.2 tr trillion when we can pay almost a third of that? I think that's something that the taxpayers have to be asked. Hey, fellas, are you aware of these costs? Improving power station construction. So one of the things I'm no doubt you've heard about is how terrible some um, constructions are and they blow out. Well, guess what? Every big project has a risk of blowing out. Jacopo Bongiorno has, has actually investigated some of these. One of the things he's also done is he's also looked at the sort of potential uh, improvements of nuclear versus renewables. So let's just look at one variable, which is land usage. Nuclear, you can get 2,260 megawatts per square kilometer. When you get one megawatt per square kilometer. Um, nuclear is the quiet achiever of the world. It's operating in all of these countries. Most of us wouldn't have heard of that before. I had no idea Czech Republic had nuclear. Did anyone else? Do you know what I mean? It's, these are things <laughs> one person did good on you. And you. But you see my point is that most people literally don't. And, and that's something we have to socialize. Say, hey, fellas, you know this bogeyman that you're so frightened of? 
Most of the world relies on it, and it hasn't been a problem. You haven't heard about it, have you? OK, some, some nuclear plants recently, and I, actually, I'm just going to check on time. How am I going, Joe? OK, thank you. Um, so, um, so here's some of the plants. This is a, a US plant, um, and this is a French plant, a Finnish plant, a UK plant. All these plants here are more expensive, considerably more expensive than these guys here. Where were these ones built? This is UAE, Japan, Russia, Korea, and China. Why is it that we can't get our act together and build plants at a fair price? What's going on there? And there is a consistent pattern in there. And, um, and certainly there is an emerging feel that the reason for this is because of the way that we manage our approvals process. So if you start an approvals process, it's gonna take an unknown amount of time, maybe 10 to 20 years, you're not gonna do your design up front because why would you pay you know, uh, you know, half a billion dollars for your design and carry the interest costs for 20 years or maybe forever because you might never get it up. So guess what do you do? You wait until you get your approval and then you start your design. You say, okay, team, start. Imagine the pressures on your project at that point. Clearly, you're gonna be compromising problems. That's what we do. So we have to change the politics of the approvals process to, to fix that one. Okay, there is another fix too that we need to, need to make. And this is this idea here that, this is a, look at that graph. Isn't that, uh, this is remarkable. R squared of 0.8, that's very, a very strong correlation. Um, so what does this say? This says that if you complete your design before you start construction, then you have a much better chance of getting a low cost project. Duh. You know, that's called good planning, right? Okay, Eric Engersall talked about applications of current nuclear technology. This you're gonna love. So this is putting nuclear facilities at an existing coal-fired, co-located with the coal-fired plant, you build the nuclear while your, fire, your coal station is still operating and delivering energy. And then at the end of life of your coal plant, instead of turning off the lights and everybody go home because they haven't got a job anymore, they walk across the road and walk into their new nuclear plant. Same skill sets, same people, same community. How good would that be? Future technologies. Stefan Quist, I cannot pronounce that. I'm gonna, can someone else have a go at that for me? Because this is it? I, uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, Stefan's a nice guy. He's a very smart guy, as you'll see in a minute. So Stefan is an expert in advanced nuclear. And he, and he comes up with this beautiful uh, terminology called a technology buffet. So basically he's saying there's so many variables in nuclear because we haven't been allowed to look at it, because all of the sort of, let's call it our, our hands have been tied for the last 50 years. He said there's now, I feel like a new realization that, that there's 12 million reasonable combinations of these. About only a 900 have been uh, considered to some extent, but 40 are in active development. That means that nuclear not only is a solution today, but it could hold enormous potential for tomorrow for engineers, scientists, and for the benefit of the community. Here's an example of just some of the, uh, the SMRs, for instance, that are under development. China, India, Argentina, Russia. This one here, it's in 2028. It, you, this is uh, uh, Ontario. Um, and so there's a lot going on in the world. Again, the quiet achievers. Um, here's one very cool example of future nuclear, where you take modular, these are each a modular nucleus. And one of, the, one of the guys here asked me about the size of these things. They range from maybe you know, 10 to, to 300 uh, megawatts capacity. Imagine if every one of these was 300 megawatts, 300 megawatts, 300 megawatts, 300 megawatts. 300 megawatts. There's a lot of power being generated at this site. And imagine if you have these overhead cranes that allow you to easily maintain them. Look at this, here's one you know, lifting out a reactor and so on. Here's scaling, you can see how this is scalable. Your shared support services, and you can see how these could scale out to there. How exciting is that? Then you not only have a one-off facility that by the way is also producing hydrogen here when it, the energy is not needed for the, for the grid. Doesn't that make so much sense? And because of the scalability, you start to get some serious economies of scale. And you can not only you know, make energy, you can make money, which we all have to do to eat. The other exciting thing we learned, and almost finished, the other exciting thing from, from, um, from MIT was what they've been doing with fusion. Now, the old saying, fusion is 30 years away and always will be. 
uh, is still the case, but these guys are starting to maybe shorten that. Maybe it's 25 years away and always will be. Um, but this is really, really exciting. I'm not going to go into detail here, here other than to say these guys have got, they expect to have a working fusion power station, demonstration station, going within a few years' time. And it's already broken ground. Check this out. This is 45 minutes drive northwest of Boston. This is the foundations for a fusion power plant. And that's currently underway. It's based upon research. And I'll tell you how fast these guys move. The paper that they published that describes the technology in this was published in 2021. It's now 2022. And that's how much work they've got done. Changing community attitudes. Guys, this is one of the problems, the biggest problems here. We're, we're all engineers and scientists. We really need to engage political scientists um, and, and solve this big problem. Some people have already done this in the world. Ate Harjani has done this in Finland. Check this out here. This is from a demonstration in Finland. How many times have you seen this here in Australia? And how did they do it? One is they, they they uh, uh, created a sense of ur urgency, which if we could do that here, and I think we can, then that will help to get people's bums off seats. And the, let's call it the quiet majority will come out and vote and say, no way, I don't want that shit. And that's, I think, what we have to do. The other, what else did they do? They had concrete case examples. They had a plan. Okay, guys, we need to develop those plans. They had science-based policy making. Wouldn't that be, I'd become religious if we had science-based policy making. <laughs> that would be something else. And uh, we're going to hear from David Gillespie next, and I hope, hope he has the answer for that one, because that's a tough one. Um, and of course, the fact that they have, they have managed to persuade people that, guys, this is renewable energy. The way that we've managed our, our energy ecosystem with nuclear, where we're storing the fuel in our own storage cells in the ground, we can remove that in future years to reprocess it. And you get this virtuous cycle, this circular economy. Conclusions and recommendations. One, AMA's current renewable energy options appear to be much more expensive and uncertain than nuclear. Two, proven nuclear technologies are deployable and we can start now. Three, nuclear energy may be the only technology that is capable of preventing irreversible climate change. Nothing else has proven to be able to do it. Four, Australia has a critical leadership obligation to quickly build our own net zero systems so that we can assist developing countries. For God's sake, let's stop messing around, fix our problem, and get out to the world and help them and, frankly, sell some stuff. And five, the first priority is immediate removal of the federal and state nuclear prohibition so that nuclear energy can be considered on its merits. Thank you very much.